So Larry, you want to introduce our next guest? Sure. Um, Lathe Morat. Lathe has got a, a pretty, you know, broad um, spectrum of things that he's done. So rather than me try and tell you all, Lathe, give us a little bit of background. Welcome, sure. Lathe. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So, you know, for me, uh, my background's really marketing, but I would say that it's broken down more into the consumer psychology. That's kind of my focus because as a marketer, and I'll go into what I do, I believe there is both the rational and irrational decisions. So data, science mm -hmm. important, but human behavior is actually critically important in understanding how to marry the two. And so that takes me backwards into, I started my career at Neiman Marcus. I was in the buying world. I worked in the in-circle program, developing programs for the ultra wealthy, really focused in on details, on what matters to them, things money can buy, can't buy, access, exclusivity, um, really catering to that audience. Uh, from there, I really left and went to be a consultant. I was SVP strategy, working with Nike on how do you take the data, the segmentation of sneakerheads and create loyalty and you know CRM programs and communications to actually talk to them to make them feel valued and catered. Uh, worked on the Hilton Honors, you know, loyalty program, the Diamond Level, Hertz Number One Club Gold, Victoria's Secret, Pink, when they launched it with, uh, you know, kind of these college kids and going out there. So all around using data and segmentation and marrying that to actually human behavior. And how do you, how do you match the two? Um, I spent three and a half, four years at Yahoo as VP Global Marketing Acquisition Retention, understanding how to actually talk to customers digital world uh, from affiliates to SEO, SEM, and uh, did a couple CMO stints. I, uh, for those of you who are fashion experts, uh, Iris Atfell, who is a legend in the fashion world, 90 something year old, great documentary. I put her in a bathtub. Um, <laughs> probably the only one who did it. Billboards all across New York City. Had a lot of fun with that. So really focused in on brand PR. Um, and then I joined Fanvestor recently, about nine months ago, and I've been working with celebrity clients and really helping them cater how do you position, how do you message, how do you get your brand exactly in the place you want to be. And then more importantly, how do you think of yourself as a total brand in a business and an entrepreneur? Because it's really critical that in today's world, especially coming after COVID, that you actually leverage your ability and your brand and your talent and your fan following to actually look at yourself as I don't just have one path to revenue or success I have multiple so fanvest is a pretty new company I mean how would you summarize like what what is fanvest and what do they do uh, fanvestor you know uniquely it's uh, it's an amazing concept if you think about it so ultimately celebrities influencers have these tremendous talents I mean tremendous fan following and so what fanvestor has done is said how do we leverage your fan base to activate them on if you're starting a new business, if you want to start a new restaurant, a pizza place? How do you leverage and raise money and capital from them? Leveraging the Jobs Act that came out in under Obama in 2012, went into effect in 2016. You know, how do you actually raise money through crowdfunding? How do you actually launch a new product? So maybe you didn't need the money, but you wanted to actually launch it to your fans first. How do you give them exclusive experiences? And ultimately, how do you, you know, support charities? So I've seen, you know, recently Lily Collins and some others supporting India and what's going on there and, you know, really giving back. There's always charities and philanthropic events that uh, celebrities get behind. So really being in the center of it to help celebrities raise money for a business you know, support them with a product launch or actually go forward and support charities. And then in a couple months, we'll be launching NFTs, which really could be any one of the three, but it gives uh, celebrities in a digital world an opportunity to actually have another revenue stream or another opportunity to give access, exclusivity and privileges to assets that are theirs. And what's nice is it's actually they'll get a piece, even if it trades hands um, thereafter because of the provenance on the blockchain. So interesting. I want to get back to the NFTs in a second, but uh, I, I just want to throw out a question. I'm sure you've been asked before. Celebrities make tons of money. Why, why do they need my money to start a new business? So it's a great question. So 
everyone needs to understand two things about celebrities. So an actor, you hear them, oh, I got 10 million for a project. Their take home after their agent, their manager, and everything else is far, far, far less than that. So start with that. But they still don't need money. They still have, you know, four and a half million in the bank, much more than uh, most Americans, right? But what they give up is they can either put their own money into their business or more often than not, their brand and their name has tremendous value. They can call up Goldman Sachs and in an instant and get a meeting to say, hey, I've got a new pizza place I want to launch. I, I need some financial backing and I want to go do it. They don't want to give up control. They no. don't want to give up uh, the board seats. They don't want to do any of that. And so what they really want to do is also think about they talked to their fans and especially with COVID, they were interacting with their fans and you saw many of them say, you guys have helped me get through these hard times of mental health, of you know times where we've been touring. You know, If I'm a musician, I had tour plans and all of a sudden I'm stuck at home and I don't know what to do. And if you're an actor, you know, sets are shut down. All of a sudden, they're interacting with their fans more and more. And so one of the big things for them, and I hear it a lot from them is, well, I would love my fans to have a piece of my business. I'd love it. it. It would make sense because they would not only help me build this business, but they can get the piece of the action on the back end if it's successful. Mm -hmm. And celebrity businesses are the most successful in the world right now. Yeah. But, Omar, I know you, you have been asking lots of questions about NFTs and things yeah. like that. As, as someone in the music business, it seems to me, and I don't really understand it, and I think we'll throw this to late. Yeah. Um, it seems like there's this incredible new opportunity out there for creative people of all kinds. Late, what's your, th your yeah. thoughts of how it's, NFTs play into the music business? So I think it's a perfect storm. So NFTs obviously started, you know, a, a little bit back. And for those who don't know it, you know, it stands for non-fungible token. Best way I can describe an NFT is literally if Omar I give you a dollar you could give me a different dollar and it's still equal same value if I give and that's a fungible token so that's completely fungible non-fungible token NFT is I give you a plane ticket with my name on it that has no value to you you can't return it you can't do anything with it you could give me your plane ticket with your name, I can't use it. It's unique to you, the value is placed in you. So an NFT really has a unique provenance to it. It's on the blockchain and it says that that single piece has the value and carries the value. You can't exchange it with something similar. It can be copied, but it can't be, it, it, it has no value. And so the perfect storm that's occurred in music really has been um, COVID hit artists who make a ton of money um, and the majority of them money from touring, from radio, yeah. from, uh, you know, actually selling merchandise, getting out there, went away. Radio slowed down. So everyone turned to streaming. Well, for any musician you ever talk to, streaming pays very, very, very little. Yeah. And so your songs being streamed have have no not no value but much less value to to feed to feed your family you're staying home you have no revenue stream so you combine that with this whole idea of an nft which says hey what can i create that's digital art that's unique and how do i actually take that uniqueness and give my fans access or actually creative ways or expand to a new revenue stream that actually could be really helpful down the road. So you think musician, obviously they own the rights to the song. So if it's played on, you know, in a commercial, everything else, there's there's money to be made there downstream. NFTs are similar. If it's passed on, if it's a second transaction, they can actually get money similar. But I think Post Malone uh, sold one um, millions of dollars in, in, in a few minutes, uh, in 24 hours. Um, but I see a lot of musicians actually opening it up and saying, hey, you buy this NFT, you get a, a virtual, you know, I'm going to do a virtual concert, but you get the first 10 minutes. So it's not only that you get the NFT of, you know, maybe that one song clip, but you actually get access to things. And NFTs, the digital nature allows you to actually 
unlock. It's like going into a room to a house and having a door locked and all of a sudden the NFT opens that door and you hear a musician play for 10 minutes that no one else could get into and that becomes your value. And, so, and it also giving a lot of, um, you know, the, the, it's also bringing in a lot of um, the visual artists into this game because a lot of the visual artists before really weren't doing as much work you know painters and people in the right. digital world so they're coming in one of my friends well i know i mean i met him on clubhouse so i guess we became friends uh his name is don diablo he's a very well-known world-known dj um and he sold his nft and and it just coming back to your point that you know he sold it for like eight figures right because he's a well-known dj right so but what he did is he person guy the guy that bought it he's in dubai and and don is in netherlands right so he actually traveled to dubai to meet with this guy and then he also gave him access to backstage you know for life you know what you were just saying yeah it's so, a, it's amazing and if you think of nfts so you got to be a little bit of a student of history. I'm kind of a geek that way. I, I like to, there's no new idea that hasn't been done before. It's just done in a different way today. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the things that a musician can do with NFTs? Everyone's trying to say like, well, I'm not a painter. I'm not that like, maybe I give them backstage passes or whatever else, but let's go back to what would have been the most valuable NFTs in today's world for a musician, John Lennon's lyrics. How many people have actually bought the reprint of his lyrics, you know, for yesterday or whatever song it is where he's painted and doodled and little things? Well, an NFT, whether it was lyrics or a basketball trading card or a baseball trading card in the physical world, Michael Jordan's shoe after The Last Dance came out, you know, the game-worn yeah. shoe for his rookie season sold at Sotheby's for millions of dollars much more than they expected. All those are kind of the, you know, entree into what is an NFT and where's the value in the future and what, what it is. So if you think like, what do people actually want? They want a piece of your personalization. They want something unique. They want to feel closer to you as an artist. They want to feel like they have a piece of you. That's why John Lennon's lyrics are so valuable because they feel closer to him, right? Uh, you know, even though he passed away. And those are the things that I think people value, backstage passes, anything yeah. that gets you access and exclusivity, you pair that. If you're an artist on the side, how do you do a unique piece of art, never before seen? Yeah, people can copy it, but you, when you buy the NFT, are the owner and you have provenance on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And that's another way that you know artists should be thinking about value because Yes, you know, we know some concerts are coming up and we know touring will start back up and, you know, everything is going back to what could have been normal, but it'll never get back to what is normal. Streaming is here to stay. So artists have to continue to look to, to diversify and continue to find other revenue streams, whether that's support, you know, in support of a new product that they want to launch. And you see a lot of it with Conor McGregor just sold his, uh, you know, his whiskey. And then you see Rihanna with Fenty Beauty as a musician coming out there. There's a lot of products they can launch. NFTs are one other angle that just gives you a personal feel and it's very personal. But you see it going beyond what we're talking about. Now, Larry and I were discussing how this can go into like ticketing, right? For concerts. The equivalent of baseball trading cards and right. things like that, you know. There's that very high end, you know, we've seen some, you know, visual artists sell for millions and stuff. But then there's kind of that everyday thing, which I think is going to become the kind of the norm. I mean, the, the, and I think baseball cards and trading cards are the perfect example of, you know, kind of a lower uh, level but high volume. But I'm seeing, like, I'm seeing a lot of artists jumping in that you know, a lot of people, I would say, are jumping in. You know, I'm getting inundated on my DMs, you know, on Instagram. People saying, hey, I'm a visual artist. <laughs> you know, check out my stuff. Can you do some music for it? And maybe we could do something. And so is, is it getting saturated already? I mean, how do you... 
You know, my, it, it's a tough question, right? I agree with Larry. And I, also before, I'm sorry, but also what I wanted to add is like these artists that are selling like Post Malone or whatever, I mean, is is there a limit on how many they can do? Is Post Malone can literally do once one NFT per month? Is that okay? Or he needs to say, okay, I've done two or three and I'm going to hold off and that's it because I want the value because you said he sold it for millions. So if he keeps doing it, isn't the value of NFTs will go down in the secondary market? Well, I, I think that they're in, you know, Larry's example, baseball cards. Yeah. If they're printed a thousand of them, there's less yeah. value. Yeah. If it's a one of a kind, I think the most valuable base, uh, basketball cards have like a piece of the jersey yeah. that, you know, they've put on it. I think, you know, people have to be cautious. Some people are looking at it as a quick, like, oh, let me make some quick cash. Yeah. I think the people who are being really authentic about it, really, like Kings of Leon mm -hmm. put it out there, you know, with their new album to try to get extra hype. I didn't really think that that was genuinely an authentic way to use it. I think if Billie Eilish would have turned her Vogue cover shoot into a couple NFTs, you would see that tremendous value because she's never dressed that way it got more likes on instagram mm -hmm. but she showed a side of her that no one has ever seen so if you think of nfts showing an inside look at an artist i think that's where the value will be at the higher end at the lower end i think larry's exactly right right you know these are more like baseball cards or basketball cards or whatever it may be hey i'm gonna give you access to get into the stadium. You've got this, you're gonna actually go see me do my, you know, you're gonna get a chance to go backstage. You're gonna get a chance to, you know, hear me record early. Oh, I'm playing at the, I'm playing at, you know, whatever, Staples Center, or I'm playing at the Hollywood Bowl, a more intimate setting. What greater way than to give you a clip of, hey, you get an exclusive clip of my performance, but it, as part of that, you also get to take home, you know, actually physically meeting me. So I think the physical, it comes back to the digital world alone will never satisfy the human mm -hmm. behavior. So whenever you can match the, the, the emotional side into it, I think you're gonna win. And, yeah. and that emotional side may come virtually just because we've gotten used to it, but giving them a little bit of insight into you will, will keep them a long time. Let's move away from NFTs for a second. Let's talk about the other thing that, you know, we hear so much about these days, you know, the whole issue of crowdfunding. It, we've heard that there are changes in laws and regulations that have happened in this year, I guess, through the Security Exchange Commission. How, what exactly is that? How is it changed and how does it impact the, so, you know, particularly music or the entertainment business? So 2016 uh, laws went into effect that allowed accredited and non-accredited um, investors uh, and non-accredited is like 99 percent, 500,000 accredited investors in the U.S. I'm not saying more couldn't qualify. That's who's actually gone through the process. Um, invest in startups. And so they could invest, startups could raise up to a million dollars in a regulation crowdfunding platform and 50 million in a regulation A plus, which for lack of a better word, it's not, an, it's not a mini IPO, but that's a great way to describe it. We will be right back after this message from our sponsors. Beginning March 15th, rules changed and uh, FINRA um, changed the rules saying, hey, you can now raise up to 5 million in a reg CF and up to 75 million in a reg A+. Um, the reason that's significant is, you know, a million dollars was a significant amount, obviously, um, to raise to start your business. But a lot of a lot of companies or celebrities with their backed businesses are looking to raise two and a half, three million. Well, going from in the past, you'd have to go to a Reg A plus. It was, as I said, a mini IPO. You're talking four, six months worth of, you know, paperwork and everything else to get through it. And now you're in a Reg CF, which can be done in, you know, 
three to five weeks uh, with you know an accountant, an attorney, a business plan, and everything else, and you can raise up to five million. Why that makes sense is you're basically able to now take your fan base and let everybody in on it. And so, you know, you imagine that you are a musician and instead of giving the labels and everybody else all the money and the royalties and everything else, you want to self-publish and you need money to produce it. You need money to, to pay the other artists that are going to collaborate with you up front and you want to go put it out there you know, raising $5 million to put something out there and then all that money stays in house, so to speak, as a musician, you're not giving it away, um, makes a lot of sense. And imagine if you did that and you put it in, Omar, you're a very talented musician. You imagine if you did a deal with Billie Eilish, you self-produced one song, the royalties. Well, if I could invest in that, guess what? I'd write a check tomorrow. And that's the difference with what's happened today is traditionally you wouldn't let me have that chance. People talk about democratization. Well, democratization is twofold. One is, can I even have, like, is it even possible for me to? So regulation crowdfunding says, yes, it's possible for me to invest in that. But if you're doing an album with, you know, Billie Eilish and I could be an investor in that, the democratization is that Fan investor has actually said, hey, you as a celebrity, let your fans in on it. Let your fans get a piece of that action because you know that that will be the, you know, imagine you did a Christmas song with her. Mm-hmm. How well would that do in royalties year after year after year after year? You saw how much Mariah Carey's song is worth, mm-hmm. you know, every year and just, you know, royalties. So yeah. those that's what's important. So it seems like the, it totally changes the leverage. It used to be that... <clears throat> no artist could afford to do this stuff, so therefore they needed the record company and gave away a lot of their rights. I think right. probably, you know, the David Bowie situation is probably the the best case where David realized that, um, you know, if every dollar his music made eighty seven cents was going to a record company and he was only seeing thirteen, and he issued the, these things called Bowie bonds. Um, where he was then getting, you know, 100 cents on the dollar. His fans invested in him and got a return. I think it was 8% a year or something close to 8% a year. Um, but how did, now, like, do you really need a record company anymore or can the typical artist do this himself? I, I mean, I think I think there's advantages of record companies. I'm not going to say there's not. And there's access, you know, there's relationships with uh, radio stations. Obviously, a musician getting on the radio is extremely important uh, for the longevity of their, you know, the music they put out there and, and the money that they can be made. But I do think it gives them leverage to say, I've got 40 million fans, you know, Billie Eilish has more leverage than anybody else Mm -hmm. right now. Six million or a million likes in six minutes means she can hold it and say, look, if you're not going to give me on my terms, you know, we see you hear the stories, record labels dictating what type of songs to put out first, what types of, you know, what's your first single? You hear them saying, here's how you're going to tour. Here's how we're going to you have to live by our rules because we're funding you. Well, she, she could turn around and say, well, actually, my fans are going to fund my next tour and I, they're going to do it my way. Huh. And that's a really powerful statement for someone. And, you know, I use the example of The Rock, who's obviously very, very high profile, but very high profile in Disney. You see him in a lot of Disney movies. Well, he has 170 million followers and Disney has 22 million. So who really has more power? Mm-hmm. And that's an interesting question. Billie Eilish or her record label? Who has more power? But but she but but the record label is, you know, they will tell you very quickly that hey, we put the the money behind you. We made you who you are. Right. Right. And so I think for me, like as an artist, you know, what I've noticed is a combination. You know, a lot of the times a label can bring, like you mentioned, relationships. Mm -hmm. And also, for instance, in Spotify, you know, some of these huge playlists that have millions and millions of followers are controlled by, you know, the, the, you know, the major labels, right? So major labels. So. Yes, you could say, yeah, I can work outside the system, 
and it's kind of what I'm doing right now as an independent artist. Yeah, you have good opportunities as long as you have people funding you and you can get the funding, you can, but you can never get into some of those spaces unless you have a major label. And I think it's the same with studios, right? Film studios are the same. You can make yeah. independent films, but yeah. you can get into certain systems that the major film studios are in, right, Larry? Yeah, I think, you know, the all this new technology is, is kind of diminished the ability of big corporations to take advantage of creative people. It's yeah. changed the leverage yeah. so that you can get a much more fair deal there. You're not going to be, you know, it's not going to be rape and pillage, you know, in favor of one person. It's kind of leveled the playing field a little and and people who are truly creative and truly artists now have a chance of reaching out to their fans and dealing directly with them without having to go through middlemen and get to know them very differently. But um, before we wrap up, right, Leigh, tell us um, some of the projects you're working with uh, with FanVesta now. Why don't you just tell us uh, what's coming up? So, so we just uh, are in pre-launch mode with Amari Stoudemire um, and Super Dope Q. Super Dope Q is a celebrity stylist on uh, the show Black Ink on VH1. Amari Stoudemire, former NBA basketball player, um, six-time All-Star, um, 14 years in the league. So we helped them launch some projects. Um, I can't really go into much detail, but we are launching a project on... Uh, Johnny Carson and his friends, where fans will actually be able to invest in, you know, the estate, the media company that is doing projects around Johnny Carson. So it's going to be super exciting mm. to think of classic Hollywood, you know, this tremendous uh, late night personality that really helped shape late night t television yeah. as a staple and a fixture in American households for years and years. You, you talk Jimmy Kimmel, you talk um, Jimmy Fallon, you talk Conan O'Brien, David Letterman, all owe their success to uh, what Johnny Carson did. And you think of the great legends from Rodney Dangerfield time, all that classic Hollywood. So you'll get a chance to invest in that. And that's a great thing for fans. Um, we have a line out coming uh, with Bubba Kush and T.S. Monk, uh, which will be amazing. Clicks TV another brand that is really giving creators an opportunity to create these amazing projects um you'll get to invest in clicks tv and now it's ramping up you know like mad so it's going to be a tremendous opportunity to really as i say let fans in on it because these celebrity projects are so lucrative um for a lot of brands not everyone will make it but the opportunity is uh, is there if you think of the biggest brands in the world today. And Amari, obviously, I like to get some styling tips from him because that guy dresses every time I see him in oh, pictures. Yeah. He's so well spoken. He's such a nice guy. You know, I say super dope, cute, super nice guy, ambitious, hungry. You know, wants to learn. You know, it's great to work with artists, musicians, athletes, celebrities that really understand, you know, you got to hustle, you got to work it. And those are the ones who we love to, to engage with because we can really help, you know, bring them value and uh, bring them exposure, whether it's a charity they want to support, you know, a friend's kid has cancer and they want to support St. Jude. Uh, they have a campaign that they want to support, whether it's anti-bullying, whatever it may be, we can get behind it and support it. If you want to raise money for a pizza shop because that's your dream, great will help you and, you know if you want to actually launch a new product great we can do that too wow that sounds amazing i want to thank you so much with those words we're gonna say thank you late for coming into the thank studio you. we learned so much and uh larry thank you again it was very informative a lot of fun always fun always fun always fun we got to come back next week so i want to thank you guys for watching the show and we will see you next week <laughs>